Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Wednesday, everybody. We begin today's video with three developments related to the technology competition between China and the U.S.-led West. In an exclusive piece published today, UK-based The Financial Times reports that the Biden administration has revoked export licenses that allow Intel and Qualcomm to supply Huawei with semiconductors. Quote, as Washington increases the pressure on the Chinese telecoms equipment company. End quote. The alert explains that the move by the U.S. Department of Commerce affects the supply chains for Huawei's laptop computers and mobile phones. The Commerce Department confirmed that it had quote, revoked certain licenses for exports to Huawei. End quote. Adding quote, we continuously assess how our controls can best protect our national security and foreign policy interests, taking into consideration a constantly changing threat environment and technological landscape. End quote. Washington already has tough restrictions on the sale of American technology to Huawei, but as we have covered in recent weeks, the company has seen a surge in revenue and appears to be finding ways to thrive in the face of these sanctions and even develop advanced chips. This has had Washington concerned, with lawmakers urging President Biden to take a tougher action against the Chinese group. Huawei's MateBook X Pro laptop, which was released last month, uses Intel's Core Ultra 9 chip. Quote, this is a significant action that indicates how seriously the U.S. government is approaching and not backing down from what it views as national security threats from Chinese technology. To the extent industry and foreign partners were watching to see whether the administration would soften its stance, this is a clear indicator that it will not, and we should anticipate any subsequent administration to continue on course. End quote. Meanwhile, yesterday, Tuesday, China-based ByteDance filed a legal challenge to the measure signed by President Biden last month that will ban TikTok in the U.S. if ByteDance doesn't divest from TikTok by the 19th of January. The lawsuit was filed in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia against Attorney General Merrick Garland. U.S.-based Bloomberg explains that the lawsuit indicates that ByteDance doesn't have any intention of trying to find a buyer for TikTok as the deadline approaches. Instead, ByteDance wants the law declared unconstitutional, saying it violates the First Amendment and represents an illegal punishment without due process or a presidential finding that the app is not a national security threat. The lawsuit marks the first legal challenge since Congress passed the law in April. In court, the Biden administration may be forced to publicly reveal classified or sensitive information as to why the law is justified and needed. Quote, in political debates, Congress has asserted a national security interest pertaining to China's access to user data. Data. But in a court, the government will have to provide evidence these concerns are real and not speculative, and it will have to explain why it could not and did not pursue less speech-restrictive alternatives to address the asserted concerns. End quote. TikTok argues that the law undermines free speech and hurts creators and small businesses on the platform, with a legal complaint expressing, quote, If Congress can do this, it can circumvent the First Amendment by invoking national security and ordering the publisher of any individual newspaper or website to sell to avoid being shut down. And for TikTok, any such divestiture would disconnect Americans from the rest of the global community on a platform devoted to shared content an outcome fundamentally at odds with the Constitution's commitment to both free speech and individual liberty. End quote. This argument evidently failed politically, with the bill passing the House with overwhelming support. Next, we will need to see whether it can succeed legally. The bill was crafted with legal experts from the Justice Department anticipating a legal challenge, so it may be an uphill battle for TikTok. Washington sees the platform as a serious national security threat, with Beijing potentially accessing user data and disseminating propaganda to 170 million Americans, about half the US population. Now, one more development on the technology front. Let's cross the the Atlantic. Also yesterday, Tuesday, the UK government said it was investigating potential findings at SSCL, the private IT contractor that was breached in a suspected cyber attack by China targeting the records of UK military personnel. The hack on the company accessed the records of up to 272,000 people on the Ministry of Defence's payroll. UK-based Reuters reports that the SSCL holds the payroll details of most of the British Armed Forces and 550,000 public servants in total through its other government 
government contracts, including with the Home Office, Ministry of Justice and Metropolitan Police. Philip Davies, Professor of Intelligence Studies at London's Brunel University, described the hack as, quote, very alarming because if a firm that close to cabinet office has lacked security compliance, what of firms more removed from the center of government or their subcontractors, sub-subcontractors and service providers, end quote. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has denied all responsibility for the attack. Next up, we move to new PRC ideology and Chinese currency devaluation risks. But just quickly, if you're getting some value from today's episode, it is a huge help if you can like. And for the 45% of regular viewers who are not subscribed, subscribing is a big help too. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are also in the description below. I rely primarily on subscriber support to keep going. This is the best way to allow me to make these uh, open and free for all six days a week and hopefully one day make it my full-time job. Thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. Next up we touch on ideology. We remember last week it was announced that the July 3rd plenum of the party will have the key theme of quote advancing Chinese style modernization end quote. As such, it is worth exploring what exactly Beijing means by this idea of Chinese-style modernization. This week, the very important Institute of Party History and Literature of the Central Committee of the Communist Party and Xinhua Institute issued a long report titled Chinese Modernization, the Way Forward. It's important that we note some of the points here, not because we necessarily agree or disagree with them, but because it's critical that we understand the ideas being discussed and debated within Beijing's policy and elite circles. The piece argues, quote, Based on an in-depth analysis, this report asserts that Chinese modernization has given rise to a new form of human advancement. Chinese modernization is different from Western modernization in the following ways. It puts people, not capital, first. It debunks the idea of the end of history. It pursues the constant improvement of innovation of systems and institutes. It pursues a model of comprehensive and coordinated development, not one dimensionality and alienation. It ensures that the people run their country and that democracy is not practiced for the few. It strives to both preserve cultural heritage and enrich it. And it rejects unilateralism in global governance and and advances the building of the human community with a shared future. End quote. As we can see, this ideology is being consciously erected as a challenge to Western systems and thinking. And as we have seen with previous videos, it looks like this ideology is not only being erected for domestic consumption, but in preparation for export. The piece continues, quote, Throughout history, Western modernization theories have been constructed based on Western experiences. In this context, China grapples with a vast territory, a significant population, and pronounced regional disparities. Its path to modernization requires resolving numerous intricate issues, some of which the West has never encountered. In a remarkably short period, China has accomplished an industrialization process that took the developed Western countries several centuries. The Chinese modernization has provided an alternative approach to development, shattering the delusion that modernization equals westernization end quote next up and finally for today this week george magnus veteran economist at oxford university's china center published a column arguing that there's little point and much risk if the chinese currency the yuan is allowed to drop significantly but it could happen regardless concluding that the risk of a renminbi devaluation is very real this is a space we've been following closely for some time. To end today's video, we will examine some of Magnus's piece, which we are now quoting selected excerpts from directly. Real speculation about a significant devaluation of the still-closed managed renminbi looks rather fanciful, given that China runs a large manufacturing trade surplus and a balance of payments surplus of about 2% of GDP, and that is probably understated. Yet Japan's surplus is larger, and this has not stopped the yen suffering a deep slump. China could follow suit. The strong dollar is partly the reason, but in China, the main story is the persistent decline in interest rates towards zero, domestic, economic and financial circumstances, and a policy conundrum. It should be noted that there is little point in or benefit from a policy-induced or accidental depreciation of the renminbi, which, if it were to happen, would have far-reaching economic and political consequences. 
From a domestic angle, there is no case for helping exports, given China's strong external trade position. It would also be precisely wrong to further discourage imports and consumption when significant changes are needed in distributional and income policies to strengthen domestic consumer demand. The government should announce targeted income and consumption fiscal support for households, financed by withdrawing support from companies and state entities, thereby neutralizing incentives for capital to leave the country, at least temporarily. But if such fiscal support is limited and monetary easing prevails, a weaker RMB will aggravate China's deeply embedded financial imbalances and its endemic proclivity to overproduction and exports. This would in turn exacerbate existing trade frictions in new sectors such as electric vehicles and climate change equipment and older sectors such as steel, metals and shipbuilding. A perceived policy of currency depreciation would doubtless incur hostile reactions from the US and the EU. China's government would also not welcome the disruptive repercussions of a currency depreciation shock. Memories of the 2015 financial chaos in which a mishandled adjustment of the RMB precipitated significant currency pressure and capital flight are still fresh. And yet, it could still happen. Since the latest easing cycle started in 2022, interest rates have fallen by about 0.7 to 0.8 percentage points, with five-year borrowing rates falling to 3.95 percent. Inflation, however, has fallen by more. Real borrowing rates for companies and households after adjusting for inflation have jumped from a bit above zero to three to five percent, tightening the restraints on private firms and the economy. Unless inflation in China is going to turn up sustainably, which seems a long shot given enduring supply and demand imbalances, nominal interest rates are headed incrementally towards zero. These circumstances then raise for China a so-called Mundell-Fleming trilemma, named after the two economists who argued that a country can only ever choose two out of these three options, an exchange rate pegged to another country, an independent monetary policy, and open capital flows. China has typically opted for a soft peg and monetary independence. Over the past several months, the government has moved to harden the peg and required state banks to intervene to support the RMB close to around 725 to 7.3 to the dollar. In the coming weeks and months, we should expect reductions in interest rates in an economy that remains on the cusp of deflation with softening domestic consumer demand, loose financial conditions, further falls in some asset prices such as property and weak investment returns would probably exacerbate unrecorded capital outflows despite controls. In the face of both, the RMB is likely to get weaker. Between 2014 and 2017, I estimate China's financial system assets rose from four to 11 times the reserves. In 2023, at 65 trillion US dollars, they were 20 times as large. This cannot go on without limit. And eventually, following Stein's law, the German B will be the weakest link. Here ends the direct quote and today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a great Wednesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.